Here are notes for the steps leading into World War II, or causes of World War II. So it's helpful to know both sides fighting the war. And on the Axis side, we have Japan, led by Hirohito, who's the emperor, and Tojo, who is their military leader. Italy is led by Mussolini, and Hitler is the leader of Germany. At the beginning of the war, they will be also supported by Stalin and the Soviet Union, um, but he, of course, switches sides in the middle of the war. The Allied powers on the other side are led, the United States is led by Franklin D. Roosevelt. Great Britain, of course, has Queen George, but, of course, Winston Churchill is the prime minister and therefore really the leader of the war. France is led by Charles de Gaulle. He is, of course, once France is taken over by the Germans, going to flee to London and lead his French government in exile there. And then the Soviet Union is led by Stalin, and the star there is, of course, because Stalin switches sides and originally started the war on the side of the Axis powers. <coughs> the League of Nations is going to start by responding to aggression um, through the use of appeasement. It's the policy of granting concessions to potential enemies to maintain peace. And you see this usually happening in, like, grocery stores or toy stores, where parents are appeasing their child who is screaming their head off by buying them the toy that they want, which, of course, doesn't make anything better because then the child realizes that they can just get whatever they want by merely screaming their head off. Therefore, always tell children no. I'm totally kidding about that. Um, but so in the 1930s, the U.S. is going to respond by signing what are called the Neutrality Acts, stopping the sale of arms to nations at war once war has been declared. Um, and the U.S. is going to try and pull themselves away and become much more isolationist after uh, World War I because they don't want to get involved and in, pulled into any of these European wars that are potentially going to make them <coughs> um, lose men and have to fight another war. So from here on, it's best to kind of do a flow chart of your notes rather than kind of, um, it's not a timeline or anything like that, just so you can see what happens when. So starting in 1931, Japan is going to attack Manchuria, which is a, also called, which they rename as Manchuko, um, which was a Chinese province known for their rich deposits of iron and coal. Japan, of course, wants them to fuel all of the factories in Japan in order to make more products and become more industrialized. Now, the League of Nations is going to condemn the actions <coughs> excuse me, and tell Japan they can't do that. And, of course, Japan is just going to withdraw from the League of Nations at that point. Not really caring, and Japan is going to decide to continue to expand. A couple years later, Italy is going to attack Ethiopia. Remember, from imperialism, Ethiopia had been the last independent country in Africa. The rest of Africa had been colonized. Um, and Italy does this partially to keep you know, the Italians' minds off of their economic problems, from the Great Depression. Ethiopia is going to fall in 1936. And the leadership in Ethiopia will warn the rest of the world that it's us today, it will be you tomorrow, saying, you know, you didn't really come and help us, therefore, you know, watch your backs, you might be next. So the League of Nations is going to issue sanctions on Italy, which is a boycott of goods, so, you know, we're not importing Italian wines anymore. Although, the, remember, the United States is not a member of the League of Nations. Through this, um, this is the attack. Uh, it, Italy had control of Somaliland and Eritrea, and they are going to attack um, into Ethiopia, which is also sometimes called Abyssinia. Um, the Italians are going to have um, advanced weapons like machine guns. The Ethiopians do not have many guns. They might have some old muskets from the 1800s, early 1900s, but for the most part they're using spears and bows and arrows, and so you can tell who wins really easily. Also in 1936, we're going to see a civil war in Spain. Francisco Franco, who is the anti-monarchist in Spain leading the civil war, is going to be supported by Hitler and Mussolini. They supply him. Hitler kind of looks at the civil war in Spain as a practice for his new troops um, and for his blitzkrieg style of attack. And so <clears throat> Hitler sends a lot of troops. Mussolini sends a lot of troops to Spain. Franco wins and establishes a totalitarian government in Spain that is very similar to the governments in totalitarian governments in Italy and Germany. Hitler then starts to remilitarize the Rhineland, that German border with France, violating the Treaty of Versailles. So remilitarizes meaning that he walks in troops. And at this point, the German generals said that, 
you know, dear Hitler, de Fuhrer, we do not have enough guns to arm all of our men to march into the Rhineland, Hitler turns around and says, well, then just arm them with sticks, and if the French shoot at us, then we'll turn around and go back to Germany. Well, the Germans march into the Rhineland, which was occupied by the French, half of the soldiers carrying sticks painted to look like guns. The French flee the Rhineland back into France, and therefore Hitler has control of the Rhineland again violating the Treaty of Versailles, and the League of Nations at this point does nothing to stop it. There are no sanctions, no military actions, nothing. So of course Hitler kind of thinks he can do whatever he wants. Here's a little poster from the um, Franco um, Civil War going on in Spain. In 1937, Japan is going to attack further into China. If you think back to that original map, over here, okay, they're going to first attack Manchuria, rename it Manchukuo, then they attack further into this area around Peking, or what is today Beijing. The U.S. is going to respond by calling on all peace-loving nations to quarantine the aggressor nations, and of course the U.S. public is upset by Roosevelt's comments because they're very isolationist and they don't want to get into the rest of world affairs. The League of Nations is not going to do anything because, of course, Japan is not a member and therefore the League has no say in what goes on. So you're starting to see how ineffective the League of Nations really was. So then, in 1938, Hitler annexes Austria, which he calls the Anschluss. And he kind of starts marching troops into Austria, saying that, you know, the Austrians are German-speaking people. They are of our nation. They want to come home to the fatherland. And therefore, the Austrians were very happy about becoming part of Germany. Well, some Austrians, you know, Captain von Trapp of The Sound of Music was not very happy about that. The League takes no actions on this. Um, they kind of wag a finger at Hitler, but do nothing. There's a meeting then between France, Britain, and Germany in Munich. And the result of that is the Munich Agreement, where Hitler says, you know, I'm sorry, we won't take anything else. We just took Austria. They wanted to come home to the fatherland. That's it. In the Munich Agreement... Czechoslovakia is forced to give up an area called the Sudetenland, which is the area around the edge of Czechoslovakia, where if you look on this map, so Germany has taken over Austria, the Rhineland, and then Austria, and then this purple part is going to be the Sudetenland. Now, Czechoslovakia was a separate country and was not present at Munich to sign the Munich Agreement. So Czechoslovakia just had land given away by France and Britain to Germany. And Hitler says, don't worry, I promise, this is they're just German-speaking people in there. They were being oppressed by the Czechs. We just wanted to, you know, reunite them with their fatherland, with nationalism. I promise, trust me, I'm Hitler. I will never take any more land again. And everyone kind of says, oh, right, okay, sure thing. Chamberlain, the Prime Minister of Great Britain at this time, He's in there before he's going to be kicked out soon. He comes back and says, we have peace within our time. You know, no war will ever happen. Well, what do you know? In 1939, despite all of the appeasement and Hitler promising that he would never take any more land again, Hitler takes over the rest of Czechoslovakia. Here's the map again. So Hitler has all of these colors and he's going to take over the rest of Czechoslovakia right down here. Now, in August of 1939, Hitler is going to sign a secret non-aggression pact with Stalin of the Soviet Union. And part of this non-aggression pact is that they will never attack each other. Well, we all know Hitler is incredibly truthful and keeps his word always. That's sarcastic. Um, and the Soviet Union and Germany agree to secretly divide Poland between them. So if you look back at our map, Soviet Union's over here on the edge this right edge, um, they agree to basically split Poland down the middle. And part of that is because the Soviet Union and Russia, for a long time as an empire, had gained control of Poland and then lost them, and then gained control of Poland and then lost them, and always really wants Poland, partially because of the seaport that they have. So Hitler and Stalin signed this non-aggression pact, and everyone's really wondering how long the honeymoon is going to last before either one of them, both trustworthy fellows, are going to stab each other in the back. What happens next is going to be the Blitzkrieg, the lightning war against Poland on September 1st, 1939. Germany is going to gain about two-thirds of Poland. The Soviet Union 
earns one third of the eastern portion of Poland and war has begun as Germany attacks. So they basically come in with uh, marching through. They start with bombers attacking and dropping bombs and paratroopers, which are a new thing that they've just started. And then they send in the infantry, as you can see, marching down here through the streets. And then they send in the tanks behind them and they are attacking small villages. And so, of course, you can see how they attack in the map up into Poland up there. World War I has begun. Now, an acronym to remember this is sometimes said FAIL, F-A-I-L, so let's look at those real quickly. F is for the failure of the Treaty of Versailles. Remember that the treaty failed to include most of Wilson's 14 points that potentially could have allowed for stronger democratic countries to kind of control the parts of um, the strength of growing strength of Germany under Hitler. The treaty punished Germany, and so Germany was humiliated and really wanted revenge. So remember that when you know you're mad at someone, don't go with the humiliation and revenge part, because then they're always going to want to get back at you. The treaty also forced Germany to pay huge reparations. Remember, with the Great Depression, even before that, Germany couldn't pay. The Great Depression made everything worse. The treaty did not include self-determination for any of the colonies, which made the colonies really mad. And of course, Russia was excluded from the Treaty of Versailles because they had signed a separate peace treaty earlier with Germany. And therefore, Russia was not so happy about that, which probably led to Stalin signing the non-aggression agreement with um, Hitler. A is for the aggression by the dictators. Mussolini in Italy is going to invade Ethiopia and eventually, eventually Albania. Hitler is going to invade the Rhineland, Austria, Sudetenland, Czechoslovakia, and Poland. Hitler then creates an army which goes against all of the abilities within the Treaty of Versailles, what they say um, Germany can and cannot do. Japan is going to invade Korea, Manchuria, and China, and then two years into World War II, they're going to attack Pearl Harbor, bringing in the United States. And of course, Stalin signs the non-aggression pact with Hitler to take over Poland. So those are all examples of how the dictators were aggressive. I stands for isolationism, pacifism, and appeasement by the democracies. Britain and France just continually tried to appease Germany, give her a little bit more of what she wants if she promises never to fight a war. Obviously, that didn't work out. The pacifists don't want to fight another war, and so there are pacifists in every country saying we need to not fight, we should not be arming ourselves, all of that. And of course, the U.S. is going to be very isolationist and doesn't want to deal with other countries, and so they turn into themselves and basically focus on U.S. policies and not what's going on in other parts of the world. And then L is for the League of Nations and how weak it is. Um, the League could not stop the aggression of their dictatorships the dictatorships, um, because there was no military force for enforcement, and they had to ask all of these different countries for military force, and the military, or the countries normally said no. The United States, one of the superpowers, growing superpowers of the world, was not a member of the League, and so therefore the League didn't really have the backing of the U.S., and therefore they didn't have the clout or the strength. And then members of the League kept dropping out, like Japan, and then eventually Germany and Italy, with those sanctions placed, and so it became less effective with fewer members. Um, because they could really only act against or with members. So, F-A-I-L is the best way to remember the causes of World War II.